Well, I know we're going to need all the time that we have to explore Cameron's work, so we probably want to get started here. If you're both ready, I'll kick it off. Sound good? Okay. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Stacy Brennan. I'm the Curator of Education for the Lehigh University Galleries. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speakers this evening. Uh, we're joined today by Jenny Moira and Cameron Claiborne in conjunction with the exhibition Young, Gifted and Black the Lumpkin Bacuzzi Family Collection of Contemporary Art, which was curated by Antoine Sargent and Matt Wyckoff. The exhibition has been traveling across the country and is currently on view in our main galleries on Lehigh's campus. We appreciate you being here this evening and hope you will continue to join us for a range of free events and workshops through the end of the exhibition, uh, which ends in May. Um, a few logistics that I'd like to go over before we begin. Please be aware that we will be recording this presentation and we'll include it in the video section of Lehigh University Art Gallery's website. We ask that you keep your audio muted during the presentation and use the chat box for any questions for the presenters. And at about eight o'clock, we will begin our Q&A. Um, I would like to also thank WordStream Captioning for being here with us today to provide closed captioning. If you'd like to turn that on, you can click the CC button in the lower right corner of your screen. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Bernard Lumpkin and Carmine Bacuzzi for loaning us this amazing collection and for introducing us to a wide network of artists like Cameron um, and Denny for these wonderful opportunities for conversation. Um, so I will introduce Denny and then I'm going to turn it over to him to introduce Cameron. Um, Denny Mara is an artist, art historian, and curator and writer whose practice focuses on public art, photography, and time based media grounded in chronicling migracy through language, landscapes, and portraiture. Mara's photographic practice explores intimate communal bonds and the seen and unseen histories of Blackness. Exhibitions and public programs his curatorial research has supported include Young, Gifted, and Black, the Lumpkin Bacuzzi Family Collection of Contemporary Art, which was on view at Gallery 400 in Chicago. His writings on a number of artists appear in the Boston Art Review and Africana Magazine. And recently, Mara is the 2021 recipient of the Schiff Foundation Fellowship for Critical Architectural Writing, an award granted by the Department of Architecture and Design at the Art Institute of Chicago. He is also the Public Programs Manager at Gallery 400. He received his MA in Modern and Contemporary Art History from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. It's my pleasure to turn it over to Denny. Um, and to kick off our conversation with Cameron this evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give you the power, Denny. Thank you, Stacey. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Denny. Uh, I'm going to introduce Cameron Claiborne. Cameron Claiborne was born in 1992 in P Pine Bluff, Arizona, and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. They are a multidisciplinary artist whose practice combines elements of abstraction, craft, and spirituality. Claiborne's work draws deeply, draws, uh, draws from deeply personal experiences and sees their work as a tool for healing. Solo exhibitions include Hamburg Bahnhof, Berlin, Germany, which is forthcoming, Art Basel Statements with some, uh, Simone Sobel Gallery at Basel or Basel, Switzerland where Claiborne was awarded the Belois Art Prize, Through the Wrong Tongue, Simone Sobel Gallery in New York City, and Body Boyfriends, Chicago, Illinois. Recent exhibitions include Hand to Your Ear, curated by Gabriella Nudgent, Emmeline, uh, Emmeline London, New York, uh, no, London, UK, um, which is a forthcoming exhibition. Uh, Entra Entrainment, Someday Gallery in New York, Soft Allergy, Claire Ashley, Judith Brotman, Cameron Claiborne at Glass Curtain Gallery here in Chicago, Illinois. Good to know, Bradley Ertes Kiran in Montreal, Quebec. Intense Conditions, a presentation of the Contemporary Art Collection, Stotts Gallery, Stuttgart uh, in Germany. Uh, for more information, you should visit their website. Um, but everyone, please welcome Cameron Claiborne with a warm round of applause. <laughs> Hi, Cameron. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good, good. How are you feeling today? Good. I'm feeling great. 
just you know awesome. moving the body around <laughs> yeah, yeah um yeah i'm doing good um i'm really excited for our talk today uh there's many things to talk about so i'll start sharing my screen and we'll just jump into it so everyone can see my screen yeah okay um, so I thought we'd start by talking about um, your multidisciplinary pra practice and how you've come to talk about it uh, by using this room layout. Um, it's a very poetic image of your thinking and I find it so clever and poignant in the ways that you make sense um, of your practice and how you move between drawing, sculpture, writing, performance. Um, so could you tell us how you came about it and what this room layout does for you? Yeah. Um, one thing I will say, hold on, uh, was about the where I was born. I was born in Ar Pine Bluff, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, Arkansas, which is totally fine. <laughs> I mean, like it's because I'm totally I'm all Southern bred and I've like, you know, that's a big focal point of my life. <laughs> so it's definitely not Arizona. I wish it was. I love me some. <laughs> um, but yeah, Sorry no, about that. No, it's I all really, good. It's all good. I, I just read the actor sure. name and I was like, Arizona. I don't know why. <laughs> I knew you're from Arkansas. <laughs> I need to just write out that full. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, I can totally talk about this image. This was honestly created out of the frustration to make an artist statement, which, I mean, we can go as artists, we can always go on and on and on about our sort of apprehensions in order to go in and like, you know, create text out of what it is that we do. So for me, I wanted to create an image, which I think, sort of, yes, yeah, poetically and literally seals what it is that I do within my work and how I flow mm -hmm. in it. So the house um, is a common metaphor, is a common idea, is just mm -hmm. something that pops up a lot when I begin working. Um, there's a lot of connections to houses. And I mean, I can go into the reasons why that is, but I think we can probably get into that later in the in the talk. But for this, um, I used the sort of layout of a simple house. And then within each particular part of the house, I was connecting that to almost sort of like limits of privacy and sort of how mm -hmm. I think about each medium working. So like drawing and painting to me is something that I feel like is without thought. It's the living room, it's the easy flowing space. Like, I really don't want to try at it. It's something that I feel like I don't, um, I don't put that kind of pressure or energy towards it in that way. And then video is something that I feel like takes place in the bedroom. It's kind of private, but I'll share it in, in certain ways. Writing is something I hardly ever really like to share. So it mm -hmm. remains within the bathroom. Um, performance is obviously the, the um, move, medium of movement. And so that goes throughout the hallways and then sculpture is in the kitchen just because it always requires all these different tools and mechanisms mm. in order to create it. Um, so yeah, that's how I formed the, yeah, form this image, which was just, yeah, coming from an artist statement. I really see it as, as that primarily. Yeah, and it also, um, just from us talking about it or me hearing you talk about it is it came from, um, an exchange that you had with someone, right? Yeah, I mean, because like, I mean, hold on, who did I tell you? What did I tell you that? <laughs> like, no, you no, I think you told me about it. You told me about it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember who told me about it. Or like, yeah, I mean, we were just probably talking about how to formulate like artist statements. And then I just like could not, for the life of me, be able to do that. And so in order to do it, I had to create it inside of this you know yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. it just it makes the most yeah it's just like there it is it's very straightforward <laughs> yeah know. it's very like, straightforward I'm, I mean yeah 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 um I think when I first you know as I was telling you yesterday when I first saw it I thought about it as like a way of making the intangible very tangible like it really mm -hmm. makes certain ideas very concrete which is something that I really appreciate and I wish that like we had these forms of artist statements that didn't um, have to be all about writing. 
you yeah. know yeah um and it's it's so clever and it's honestly so smart it's very honest um <laughs> i'll say that too um and so i really wanted us to talk about um the idea of a house right after this question mm. um and like where you grew up um mm. but i think you know we'll move on to some of your early pieces um yeah. we'll 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 talk about uh your you growing up in Memphis and also yeah, yeah. Arkansas later. But um, yeah, so we should talk about now some of your early pieces, um, especially when you're working with glitter vinyl um, and steel and pink insulation um, and also your performance practice, um, which I understand relates very much to your upbringing, um, growing up with a dad who uh, was very much into physical activity. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to hear you talk about um, these pieces, especially tool holder, and why these materials, um, mm -hmm. given their um, given their luster, given their appeal and their allure, um, this this is like stuff that you would typically use for, say, like um, going night clubbing or something like that. Like you would wear something like this. Like you want to be glamorous um, and fab. And so, could you talk to us about some of the material? Um, and like what what these materials mean for you and like why did you choose them to communicate um, certain ideas about say the erotic? Yeah, well, I started, glitter vinyl didn't come into the practice until I had actually had like another run in with a professor at the time, um, which I, this was in undergrad, like my final year of undergrad where we were pretty much at the point of making things that we wanted to make. But I was just, I mean, obviously, as any artist does, having a lot of hold back and trying to let go of what it is I think I should be creating and instead of mm -hmm. what it is I actually wanted to do. So um, this kind of was, the material itself was kind of born out of that um, frustration. And I went to Textile Discount Outlet. Um, which is like in Chicago and anybody who's from Chicago knows how special that place is to artists. And mm -hmm. I had went there, I think maybe it was like my second time going through. And I just, I just didn't, I went in there without any purpose at all. I just went in there and kind of walked around and I just kept walking and just, you know, going up stairs, downstairs, just like going through all the different mounds of stuff until I finally landed on that one sort of back corner that has like all this vinyl on it. And then mm -hmm. I just remember like the last time I saw the vinyl, like at first I was attracted to it obviously because it's so shiny, it's slick, it's glittery. It has all these things that to me culminate um, something queer without trying to do that at all, you know? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. the last time I had actually like seen the material was when I went out to my first gay club in Memphis, in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that lining like the booths and some of the like, like outer parts where you could sit. And I just remember being like super attracted to it. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, that's right. I remember using this. And then mm -hmm. at the time I was like looking a lot at like Robert Morris and people who just sort of use material for whatever it is. And they don't, do much manipulation to them to that material and they just kind of let it remain and speak for itself so mm -hmm. when I went into the studio it was mainly about what could I do to it without doing anything to it mm -hmm. <laughs> then it became more about this tuck and roll more about folding things in on itself um, and finding intimacy in that and just kind of letting it rest and letting it sit and letting it be and then the mm. steel, I mean, I'm just very much into, interested in steel and I love using steel. Um, so that, that little tiny climper at the top sort of to me was a hanging mechanism, but what, what also kind of like seals it off and is like the period to the piece. And then I just kind of like, yeah, let it roll all the way down. And then I filled it with the insulation, pink insulation, which is to me like the meat of a house or the meat of any space. Um, since it literally is, it does that and it like warms the space and then kind of shove that in the center and let it look almost like as if you were cutting inside of the work and then seeing the inner anatomy of what the object mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's that's pretty much where that came from. It's this one I made after making like several of these 
And it was probably the one I made without the most amount of effort at all, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which I've, I feel like once you're in a certain kind of rhythm, it just, it, you don't have to really overthink anything. It's just, or think about it at all. It just kind of comes out in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like those are the best moments uh, of making is like when you make something so effortlessly, but at the same time, it is beautiful to you. It's something that clearly communicates your ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I see many associations um, to the body and flesh mm-hmm. with this work, um, mm-hmm. given the pink insulation um, that is very suggestive of like, say, um, your orifices or like your intestines and like everything like that versus yeah. like the glitter, it being some kind of external shell um, that is say uh that is uh, that is a signifier of like skin um of some kind of shell you know and i feel like you know this is something that occurs very often in your work is like you'll Mm -hmm. use um sorry uh you'll use you'll use uh skin tones to Mm -hmm. suggest race and also uh what it means to be a body um and so with that, um, I'd love for you to talk about this piece, Bod Bag, which is something yeah. that I've never heard you talk about. And yeah. we're looking at this work um, that is, um, uh, you installed this at the Chicago Artist Coalition, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it looks very much like something you would find at a mortuary. Um, yeah. And so could you talk, could you tell, could you talk to us about it? Um, yeah, what definitely. were you thinking in making it? Um, who who are we looking at? I'm assuming this is you. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, yeah. interestingly enough, um, this is something that can be used by almost anyone. Like someone someone else can participate in it. It's not just a personal item. It's something that can be used by others. Yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, no, definitely. So this work is the second iteration of a piece that I had done um that was titled that's I didn't really I didn't have quite a title for the first iteration which were actually done out of satin um Mm. and body bag so it's it's this is where I started to get all technical it's like funny when I'm like looking at my older works and how I how I used to think um body bag is the phonetic spelling of the word body so b-a-w-d-y um, so I was mm-hmm. kind of doing like a little tongue in cheek moment there with playing mm-hmm. with like either desire or intimacy in this way. So mm-hmm. for this piece, um, I I almost wanted to render myself into an object, which is what ended up happening. Um, and, and at the same time, the internal aspect of the work is something very different. So when I'm inside there and from other participants who have actually invited and have also been inside the bag, it's Mm -hmm. really, it either can be, it's, it can either be really intense because you're now enclosed in this thing and you have no sense of agency, or it can turn into this highly meditative moment, which for me, Mm -hmm. it it always has been meditative. Um, Because the second that you begin to stop squirming and freaking out, um, you can actually settle into your body and you become quite a, like quite aware of your body in this way. And it gets quite steamy and hot in there. Yeah, it's one of it's one of like the strangest works that I think I've ever made. And I think it's one that I'm still left with like a ton of mystery about it. And I remember mm. seeing them even without my body inside of it or without anyone's body inside of it. And seeing the amount of like weight that the emptiness actually has because like that Mm -hmm. cushion that lines the bottom the upholstery foam that lines the bottom to me is is a way in order to bear weight in order to give comfort to the body but then of course without anything in it it's just sort of there and stark and just really strange but I would say it it does um run up against like ideas of death or feelings Mm -hmm. of death to which Mm -hmm. if I mean I don't know, for me, as, as somebody that meditates in this way, there is almost like another aspect to meditation that to me is like practicing for death, which is like mm-hmm. practicing and accepting the idea that you won't exist in the same form as you always have, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, mm-hmm. like, that's why I feel like this piece is one of the like, 
yeah it's almost one that i would rather as much as i talk about it i would rather almost like not give language to it or talk about yeah it at all. yeah yeah and so the piece is activated uh by the physical body and so you know when you taught when you were just talking about it you said that um you become the art object and so i wonder do you think of yourself as such when you're moving across say a performative piece like this mm. um versus say some of your abstract sculptures that we'll look at later um mm -hmm. do you think of yourself as the art object or as an art subject and does that veer between your practices well i think that's like the awkward thing about it all because i think mm. on one hand i could I think the as you start to see in the work, the perception changes because I think mm -hmm. the more that I started to become aware of myself or started going in on myself, I felt like I had to start from a zero zero point. And in that way of thinking about the zero zero, it was like thinking of myself almost as an object first, which is like, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. a little bit. Um, I would say probably not the best <laughs> like it, like that can't remain right because that's not qualitative and that's not intimate enough that's not actual you know that's not feeling anything you know yeah that's yeah. more so like looking at yourself with this bit of starkness because to me when you say the word body body is is sounds like an object itself you know it mm -hmm. doesn't actually mm -hmm. feel like anything there's no feeling mm -hmm. behind that so i think that the more um the more that I start to go on, there's just other ways where I start to stop looking at myself as that, where I stop looking at myself as an art object or centering my world in that way, but more as an expansive body, you know? Mm -hmm. so like it's like mm -hmm. the bags no longer were necessary or needed because I no longer needed to remain in them. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like I didn't mm -hmm. want that proximity to, to that kind of rest anymore. You know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, 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 it does, it does. Um, and something that you pointed to earlier is how, and something that you've pointed to um, in other occasions is how you'll at times, or you'll actually refute um, the, linguistic of exp uh, the linguistic expression of like certain feelings and ideas yeah. in your work, um, which is something that I get just from you talking about this work. Um, it's something that is very participatory. I feel like, you know, I'm trying to embody myself in such a position of like being in this uh, object and like what I would feel. Um, mm -hmm. And like, you know, you telling me that it's somewhat of like a meditation pod for you because you stop mm -hmm. wiggling and think about okay like I'm actually here still and I just gotta lie still and breathe mm -hmm. um it yeah it just like makes me want to participate with it um, <laughs> just as you say it like <laughs> yeah no <laughs> I saw that. performance with it um I'm all willing to to work with it yeah. um yeah no, so some of the works um that you've uh, uh, some of the works that you've created have been um, a response to um, African art history and say the lack of this knowledge in your education because um, you went to school at SAIC um, and so did I and um, we're both very interested in the history of the fetish um, whether it's in the contemporary sense how we think about objects or how we how we have an association with the fetish with sexual desire or sexual fantasies versus how um the history of the fetish or the idea of the fetish came from this colonial encounter between the portuguese and the kingdom of congo and so um for those who don't know um, about nkinsin kondi um, they are power figures from uh, Central Africa uh, that are used um, to seal a bond um, and they're also used uh, as charm objects. Um, and I wanted to talk about your first interaction with Nkinsi Kondi, uh, where you first saw it um, and what kind of feelings um, arose from seeing such an object. Yeah, um, I, would, I mean, the first one I had ever seen was the one that's in the African wing in um, in the art institute so that was the first one i had ever saw 
but mm. I had never quite understood, like, you know, the idea of it being related to the word fetish or any of mm -hmm. those things um, didn't quite come to pass until, yeah, until I graduated school and started researching mm -hmm. for my own self. Um, mm -hmm what exactly was inspiring other types of work that I was looking at. And then mm -hmm. it turned out that it was, you know, really these, it was really objects that come with a multitude and multi-layered uh, meaning and also actual function for your own self and for your own mm -hmm. body. And they mm -hmm. come with a spiritual form, you know? So like, that's what I think drew me to them the most. I um, started making these pieces called Room Piercer with a tool, which like that's what the um, the steel piece that is like hanging from the sharp object, uh, which I like rounded out by like a uh, angle grinder on. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, that I use like on an angle grinder, and this piece um juts out into the space and for me like literally pierces the room in order to access it because I thought that's exactly how the Nikitsi Nakundi works is where the object um is a wooden figure in which you jab or nail into the object and then access the spirit's uh power or access whatever is in within the object and yeah yeah this piece is yeah <laughs> yeah and, and kinsey translates to spirit um and your work is very spiritual as i yeah. read from your bio uh, biography um i mean i first encountered this i mean the first thing kinsey that i saw too was uh in the uh african art section uh at the art institute and in themselves they are powerful objects when you come close to them um i mean the nails are very uh, I mean, they, they kind of represent a certain kind of violence being acted upon the body, um, but at the same time, there are objects that are used to represent power. Um, and I was really interested in hearing you talk about how your work is all about emotion and spirit and how we can, how objects, um, how you, how you, what's the word? perhaps project that in your object. Mm. Um, but you do it uh, through an abstracted way. Um, for example, in these two room piercers, um, this one is, uh, it's, uh, is this uh, gene? Yeah. Are you using gene here, right? Yeah, that's um, like, yeah, gene and denim. Yeah. Right, and there's another piece that you have with vinyl as well too, that's like more flesh tone. Um, and in this piece, um, it's also steel as well, right? Or is it clay? It's, I think this one is um, clay. Yeah, no, I made the form from clay, like just sitting at home. Uh, this mm -hmm. is like kind of like, you know, the most recent iterations of the room piercer with tools. And the tools to me became more of the focal point um, of the work, which for me, I was like less interested in trying to like gouge it out with an angle grinder and then create the form from that but more to like focus in on like what exactly the tool is. And mm -hmm. the, yeah, this tool, I just started making them almost in the way that I draw, which is just kind of like sitting at home. And I took mm -hmm. like polymer clay and then making the form because, in, and then I ended up casting them into aluminum. So I knew mm -hmm. that I was going to be casting it. So mm -hmm. given that it's like, I had like so much room to play with in order to like create it. So there was no, like overthinking or trying or you know like it was just a lot easier to form whatever the object is and then to me what whatever that is whatever that is forming into to me is exactly related to whatever the feeling that was that created it right it's like mm -hmm, I don't mm -hmm. yeah I don't I think that's the reason why I've always settled into abstraction is because abstraction to me is almost like this like sifter you know it's like yeah it's like you were like literally shaking something and then getting to like whatever the root core is of something like that's mm -hmm. how I see abstraction just because it always distills or like gives you a way to like zoom above or or be around something you know yeah yeah and it also goes beyond representation I feel like there's exactly. certain things that cannot be 
pictorially represented and right. that's the power of abstraction um, yeah yeah and so the one thing um that i also wanted to talk about is how you've written that you have a certain disdain um when it comes to people categorizing your work as fetish and i totally understand why people would why someone um would consider your work to be to fall under the category of a fetish because of how alluring um the surfaces are like used vinyl leather and aluminum um, mm. which are all materials that are used today um to create like sexual objects um mm. and like you know they're associated with leather culture and the queer community um etc and so yeah. um I'm trying, I'm, I'm wondering why you're resistant to someone using this word to define your work. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I haven't had anyone say that since like undergrad where someone said mm. fetish and then I was like, oh, okay, what does that mean? Which is mm. really what started my research into the fetish. But mm -hmm. like, I mean, nowadays, I don't, I feel like no one would ever, hasn't said that to me directly. I think what typically happens is that someone categorizes it or looks at it in the terms of like the sexual or that mm. is like somehow like a dildo or something, which mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what? Like, look, for me in terms of the viewer and the audience, I'm like, you do what you do. I'm not here to tell you how to like look at anything, you know? Yeah, but yeah. I think that there is a certain way that I am creating, which is not coming from that, which is like, mm -hmm. you know, if we talk about like Audre Lorde's uses of the erotic, you know, working mm -hmm. from a way that is from pleasure and sexual that isn't pornographic, it's like you're just, mm -hmm. you're just like feeling through it. And if that mm -hmm. is in tuned with something that is perhaps sexual, it could be, but I don't think it's the same kind of gratification that would come from like an orgasm or something like that. You right, know? right, right. Yeah. It's so, a different like, kind of desire. It's a very different kind of desire and a very different yeah. kind of way of feeling, which I think yeah. to me, it's more of like a femme way of approaching the world. You know, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's more mm -hmm. of, it's more in tuned with that nature. You know, it's like, I see that same kind of nature in like Ava Hess's work. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, what mm -hmm. even are these objects? And so many people were related to nipples and, to, and related to like, vulvuses and all this other stuff but by no means is that like the actual relationship or the actual image that she was trying to create it's just yeah what seems to pour out and then I think it also um touches about the body it just like goes back into like how crazy and weird and strange our bodies are and the things that they you know secrete and what comes out of them and then also mm -hmm. just yeah just thinking about how it stretches and how weird it is to actually be inside this thing <laughs> you yeah, know I mean? yeah. Like yeah 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 it is to exist in a body and yeah. also in the ways that we ourselves um sometimes don't know that much of our about about our bodies and sometimes our bodies do act or, uh, act out of our own volition um yeah. and i feel like your work incites such ideas um and speaking of audrey lord um actually chose a quote from her essays, uh, the uses of the erotic, the erotic as yeah. power, um, to think about how you're thinking about the erotic just outside of the idea of like sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I see your work oozing with desire of like knowing thyself too. Um, and in the essay, uh, Audre Lorde says, the erotic is a measure between the beginnings of our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced it, we know we can aspire. For having experienced the fullness of this desire of feeling and recognizing its power in honor and respect, we can require no less of ourselves. And I wonder what um, making as a, as a mode of knowing um, means to you in the studio um because lately i've been thinking about the ways that studio what's the function of a studio visit um you know what like, is it? yeah what is the <laughs> studio visit? honestly i mean i've been trying to figure that out yeah i feel like it's a lifelong mission to figure it out is. what the purpose of a studio visit is um yeah. but you know I, I really you know i really 
I really wonder like what what kind of what kind of role um what 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 is the purpose of a studio visit to you and like um you know for for me I will say like whenever I do studio visits one thing that I found to be really productive and very generative is like helping someone find a language for their work and also other people helping me find a language for my work. Mm. And so I wonder if that is the same for you or otherwise. I mean, I will, t I will say that the studio for me is perhaps the only place that I feel the most free in. Mm. So when someone walks into my studio or comes in there, typically it's because I've given them the permission to do so. Because otherwise it's, I, I've, I've let people in and then it turns out to not be a good occurrence, you know? Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've come to grow up and also know myself a little bit more and also respect mm -hmm. myself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I can't just let the, you know, <laughs> like, you know, just, I can't just let someone say something and without them having me respond in kind not so much mm -hmm. that I would be like rude or anything but I think that there is a certain limit and a certain way that we even can approach art that doesn't have to necessarily be about um trying to define it in these particular terms right yeah and I think yeah, that, that happens yeah. a lot for black artists and for queer artists mm -hmm. for femme artists mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. we're working in ways that I think the language and how we even think about it is still being developed you know it's very, yeah it is very new that we are even in grouped in the conversation, you know? So it's like, yeah. when I have someone come in, I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I really don't think that <laughs> you are seeing what it is that I'm seeing. And that's not a fault mm -hmm. to you, but that's just because maybe perhaps you haven't quite understood that, you know, art history isn't even really a history. <laughs> you know? It's like something that is built up, you know what I'm saying? It's like not even yeah. really real. So it's like I'm coming from that particular standpoint, whereas someone could be coming from it where they're literally looking at it within these periods of like modernism and then postmodern, you know, and all this right, other stuff. Right, and I'm like, right. well, none of that makes any sense because it didn't include me. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Body. It didn't include people that look like me, you know? And yeah. if it did, it was only on particular, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's, I'm yeah, very that's like, actually critical of those kinds of things when I do studio visits. And I love yeah. being able to build language with people. I just mm -hmm. feel like as someone that grew up very much trying to find the place that they could be the most themselves within the studio mm -hmm. is that for me. So, you know, when you come in, it's just like, I need that respect, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Respect. And it's important to demand it as yeah. well too. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is something a lot of young black artists um, in school and outside of school experience is this, bizarre um, interaction with say non-black people who might not understand the work or who mm -hmm. might try to categorize their work in ways that is not conducive mm -hmm. or like um but it's actually an insult to their work like yeah. I've had multiple friends come to me just tell me about how bad a studio visit was or like how bad a critique was because yeah. a group of say art historians or like our professors were trying to uh, box them within these uh, l like within this language uh, that's used in art history that really doesn't apply to them um, but then you know something that you're echoing too is like the studio is also a very personal space um, this, is, a this is where you are this is where you pour your heart out this is where um, you breathe life onto objects and make meaning out of things you know yeah. and so speaking of the personal um, I would love for us to talk about um, where you grew up um, and, uh, you know, your grandmother's house in Malvern, Arkansas has had a yeah. huge influence um, on your recent exhibition, uh, yeah. Mothership in Malvern, which is currently on view at Simone Sabal in New York City. And so um, I'm curious to know what are some memories that you have from it and how have they shaped your sense of belonging and your practice as well too, especially with the objects that we're looking at, yeah. Um, Double Dutch. Yeah, yeah. So um, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee after my parents divorced. So um, before that I was in like Texarkana, Texas. So I'm like very much all around the Southern area. Um, mm -hmm. but when 
But throughout all of that, my grandma always was in Malvern, Arkansas, which was pretty much like the focal point of our entire family, including my both both my parents' families, since that's where they also met. Um, mm-hmm. And the house that they that she had built was built by um, my grandfather on on by both grandfathers. So grandfather, my mom's side and the grandfather and my grandfather's, which would be my father's father. (laughs) So kind of Mm -hmm. like, it's all very much entangled. Um, Mm -hmm. And they Mm -hmm. built this house like, like around the 1950s, um, like from the ground up. And they also worked at a brickyard. So they were able to like, you know, create just some of the most beautiful lattice work on the like particular car porch. And I've Mm -hmm. always just like loved yeah, just like the architectural features of the house are just so incredible and so immense. And it just, mm-hmm. now looking back on it, I just think of that place, which is why I titled the sh- the show Mothership. I think of it as a mothership. I mean, so I never knew it with my grandfather being there since he passed away when I was a young kid. And mm-hmm. then um, I would go there and visit my grandma, especially when my parents were like, you know, at, at odds with each other. And It was just so, yeah, it was always the place that I felt like I could expand the most, you know, like she introduced me to Whoopi Goldberg. She introduced me to her (laughs) playing, you know, I walked around in heels and boots. I, you know, I played with her clothes. I played with my sister. Like it was, you know, for what we love to have tried to, um, what we're always doing nowadays, I feel like in terms of Black futuridity or Black futures, um, thinking about what a what a black femme space, what a what a space like that could exist as. It's mm-hmm. like I feel like I've existed there. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I feel yeah. like I've especially at such a young age too. Yeah. Um, especially in a place where you could feel comfortable and something that yeah. you could grow into. Yeah. 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 No, I felt like I've always like I've actually like been to a place that's like another planet in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, and ever since then I've kind of always felt more and more placeless in that way. Um, but yeah, I ended up uh, working on this sculpture titled Double Dutch, um, which kind of flowed from the another work that I created that didn't quite work out. And then I ended up making these forms, which are from other things I've created called cushion container bags. But I've decided to kind of like leave that language and leave that way of thinking kind of in the background. And so, mm. yeah, the, the center figure was the first one that I created. And then the one on the right, I made second. And then the one on the third came on the left, the biggest one. But yeah, I made the first one with these two little like kind of anus looking pods that were like on the side and I was able to kind of connect it. And then I remember looking at it without any connections. And I was like, wow, I feel like I've made a stark abstract work, almost like Martin Perrier, you know, like very Mm -hmm. Perrierian looking. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. um, I ended up, thinking like oh no this needs to be connected to another object it needs Mm -hmm. it needs that same kind of rope or same kind of uh lineage which is how how I think about it like line as if lineage were line um yeah and then so I created the second one which then I wove through and then just kept going and kept going honestly I see the piece as like endless um Mm -hmm. I could continue to make more uh, of the objects that then continue to create Um, But after like looking at it in this particular form, I was like, oh, so this center figure, which seems like it's cradled by the other two on the outside, just, yeah, the intimacy there, it just hit me. And then I just remember writing down in my journal, talking about double Dutch and how my grandma and my sister and I would play double Dutch Mm -hmm. um, a lot in the front, in the front yard. And just like the choreography of that. And then to me, it just was yeah it became I titled it that because it it just looks like that you know what I mean like it almost yeah, looks like yeah. these forms are playing right, right. Of double dutch like they're yeah. very much in tandem with one another you know yeah yeah um I love that you use the word choreographed because there's a certain activeness um in the in these works like it feels like they just come alive and start double uh and start jump roping yeah. um and so I wonder if you know it, it sounds like you started off with this one sculpture in the middle and then this memory of you and uh, your grandmother and your sibling. Um, yeah, yeah. 
playing double dutch emerged yeah um, and i found that so beautiful like when a word can start like from somewhere it feels i don't know i'd love yeah. to psychoanalyze this but like <laughs> you know <laughs> It's true, like, yeah. you know, the unconscious is where all our desires, all our memories are, and then, you know, it comes out in ways that we ourselves don't even know until we yeah. start making things, and we're like, yeah. oh, these are the associations that I'm making really um, between yeah. my past and my present and where I'm at, and this is how I can represent it in a non-representational way, in yeah. a way that exudes feeling um and movement um and like you said this idea of futurity um even with the connective tissues like even with the ropes that are here you know, they yeah. work as these connective tissues whether they be through memory um through movement through um tactile activity yeah. um so I yeah mean, i mean yeah no i mean i think one all one thing about the way that i make too is that i feel like i the way I've made recently, I mean, once you stop, mm. once you leave school and then you don't have all these like little tools to your device, <laughs> right? Like I got so, yeah, like I got so used to being resourceful, you know? Yeah. So like yeah. a lot of the objects I make are able to be, ex you know, you pour the sand out, you pour mm -hmm. the pot now, and then it just completely mm -hmm. flattens and you can put it into like a sealed envelope and send it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and then these objects now don't necessarily work in that way, but they still work in terms of like sand, like filled up with it, cotton filled up with it. And like the mm -hmm. rope is actually just like this wire rope, like this metal wire that I have that I've just been like wrapping around, you know, and like mm -hmm. building um, what Harm as Harmony Hammond once said, which I love her as a sculptor. She's an amazing sculptor, um, building something from the inside out which I really mm -hmm. love that just because it's, it's, it's like a form that exists that, yeah, actually has like an, a, a body or an anatomy. Like there's literally something that is like at the core of it. That's also holding all this matter that's like on top of it, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. even the, the flesh tones as well too evoke, yeah. uh, evoke, um, a body a physical body yeah um, yeah yeah um yeah go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no 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 go ahead go ahead go ahead i can go on and on about it <laughs> just because like, no, yeah the way i did the fabric um for this work which came from a lot of different just experimentation was mm -hmm. a dying uh muslin and mm -hmm. then taking that and then dipping it into Maj Paj, which I love Maj Paj. <laughs> and then um, stretching that out and then letting that um, dry. And so actually, mm. like if you could see it in, in, uh, in real life, it's really very much like this dry piece, which mm. it gives almost as if it's like wooden or mm. if it's like a dormant organisms that were once mm -hmm. doing something that aren't doing something anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in, and in order to like create these little ridges that are on uh, some of the forms and that are like these lattice work, I literally like crunched it and like balled mm -hmm. it all the way up and then expanded mm -hmm. it back out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at the most rudimentary level, I also uh, like this technique very sounds very similar to like mummifying an object. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even with the materials that you're using, like with yeah. muslin, um, the way that uh Maj Paj dries um, yeah like how crusty it can be and like how hard it can be as well too yeah um yeah I mean I see them a lot as like vessels like to me mm -hmm. they're just, like these strange vessels that contain energy and yeah they're just very much interconnected they they rely on each other for living yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um so these are some other works too that you have in the exhibition um these are could you tell us some of the materials that you've used for these pieces yeah, yeah yeah um these are titled homegrown and the forms are made from denim insulation paper dyed muslin and like the little wire that i've also used too mm -hmm. um yeah i mean and paper so paper is like the substrate i mean that's all it is is like actually just kind of 
building on top of uh, this really tough, rigid paper. And then it kind of like solidifies into this form mm. that, I, that I like drew out. And so did these start as, as drawings? Do your sculptures start as drawings and then they transform into a 3D object? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, drawing's like super, super, really important to the work. And mm. um, for, yeah, because I mean, I just lay out this very large swath of paper and then I just kind of, you know, make what would be a sort of, like from my, uh, what is this? Like my elbows from the top of my elbows down to my ankles, which mm -hmm. is not my elbows. Sorry, what are these? What are these? Your shoulders? My shoulders. Your shoulders. Yeah, <laughs> from the top of my shoulders <laughs> down to my um, ankles, and as if you were like looking at it in terms of a trapezoid, um, mm -hmm. and then making that into the form. So they like stand really very much like very confident and like in your way and like shields mm -hmm. or like their own like kind of organisms or architecture like they're just growing and existing on their own you know just kind of yeah. like how I want to be <laughs> like I want to grow and exist <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so how did you come to use uh gene as as a material in your work yeah so that came from using pink insulation which you guys like you kind of saw earlier and I was making very similar forms um, also using the pink insulation, but I just, the way that those were being related very much to the human body, I didn't want, like, I didn't want like this, like filleted, like total, uh, like almost like easy reading. And then actually a friend of mine um, walked into the studio one day and just like dropped off this denim insulation that was like inside their walls and they were like mm. hey, this came out of my walls when they were doing maintenance work <laughs> I don't know if you'll ever use this but like if you want to like here it is and it just kind of sat in the studio for a long time and then I sort of you know started playing with it and then I noticed how easy it is to kind of crunch it and smush it and create these mm. wrinkles um, mm. into the form and then mm. once it was able to once I figured that out then I just sort of kind of started working with it more and more and more. And I just love the blue. I mean, blue, you know, in terms of representative colors, it's it's a calming color. So yeah, like a cool yeah. confidence. It's a color that almost like that takes on no neutrality, but is also like here to, you know, I just feel like it's like the color that's like here to listen, that's also mm -hmm. at peace with itself. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. And then oh. just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love how you said that. It's it's that was that was really poetic um, <laughs> but go ahead I just had to say that that was really yeah beautiful. yeah no I mean I just I I love blue and the and it also removes itself from the like straight up visceral so now I feel like you can actually like look at these wrinkles and look at the visceralness of the pieces without being removed as if it was like a cut up body but more as like something that is from another world you know like it's yeah, like yeah from some yeah. other kind of space you know yeah I mean they're very organic it feels um like a cell that's growing it feels like something you would look at um under yeah. a microscope or from somewhere else you know yeah um and I wanted to talk about one uh, material that you use which is popcorn ceiling paint yeah. Um, and that is something that also came from your upbringing um, uh, in your grandmother's house. Yeah. Um, it's because her, the popcorn ceiling um, that was uh, there was with that, it had glitter from my understanding. Yeah, yeah, it had glitter in it, which was, yeah. um, turned out to be actually the room that my uh, dad lived in, which I did not know that. <laughs> mm. I mm. thought it was my aunt's room, but it was his. Um, yeah, I don't know how the glitter, I don't, I didn't, I don't know where that material came from or like who did that, but there was glitter in the ceiling. And I remember when I would stay there, I would um, stay in that room if I wasn't sleeping in her bed with her. Um, mm. I would like look up and then there's just, you know, just all this, you know, just glittering, shiny looking ceiling. And then it would also often be the way I would like just kind of sit and ponder, you know? Yeah. And, like, yeah. 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 Um, I would love to see that. I mean, I've never seen 
uh, popcorn ceiling with like glitter. With glitter in it. It's like tiny little specks too. So it's not Mm -hmm. as if it's like over the top. I mean, it's some very Mm -hmm. 70s stuff. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like, it's not like it's over the top, but it was like, you know, just tiny little like bits. And you almost have to like move your head a little in order to find it. Yeah, to really activate it. To really activate it and see it um okay and so these are some other works as well too uh, well the work to the right um is very reminiscent of your um early work um mm-hmm. with the cushion bags um mm-hmm. and i wanted you to talk about some of the choices of color that you make and why these flesh tones why this variety of like say pinks to browns to mm-hmm. like these red browns um yeah. do you talk about more about your color choices um yeah. and their relationship to flesh and the body yeah, yeah yeah um so this is like expansion cord so to me it's like the precursor to double dutch where i was like experimenting a lot with these sort of um navel and also anal like uh structures within the form so that way they can like mm-hmm. actually like, literally connect and like go to and be inside of um, other pieces. Um, This one, uh, yeah, I was experimenting a lot with like dyeing and I was using one particular type of brown. And so it just like kept turning out with like different shades. And I was actually like having a lot of fun seeing the expansiveness Mm -hmm. of, of what brown can actually like give you. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, I would say I definitely was using a lot of skin tones and a lot of browns in relationship to my own body um, in a a way to like racialize them, but also in a way to like not even think about it in in those terms, actually, but more so just like literally thinking of my own body. Um, Mm -hmm, And brownness mm -hmm. is just something that is very much indicative and one of the most beautiful aspects I find about my body. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's like, for me, the use of brown is always like a way of celebrating it. Um, And then like seeing the variances and like, you know, going from like this weird okra to this light, you know, it was just, yeah, it was a lot of fun just dyeing different colors and like seeing what um, comes up. Yeah. Yeah, And you explore that more in your, uh, in your drawing. I mean, um, in your small drawings and paintings as well, too. Uh, I mean, it's always interesting to think about how artists are thinking about Blackness in their own self, but also Blackness in its expansive sense, uh, expansive sense, and like how we actually perceive it um, visually. Um, And one thing, uh, I'll actually just stop sharing. Um, One thing that I really wanted to talk to you about is your writing. Um, It's very diaristic. Um, I love, I love, I love reading um, your work on your website. Um, It's very personal. I'm like trying to compare it to like some cool writer that I really love, but I can't (laughs) think of anyone. (laughs) Um, but could you tell us more about what writing does for you? Um, when did you begin writing? Yeah, uh, I can't quite say when did I start writing a lot. I mean, from what I noticed when I started really seeking out like what moves to make or like how to even begin what is an art practice, I started looking Mm -hmm. to other artists so, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, like Louis Bourgeois, like deconstruction, reconstruction of the father, where it's just mm-hmm. like really diary notes, you know, or like mm-hmm. notes from the woodshed by Jack Whitten. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like I'm very much drawn to like artists' biographies and artists' mm-hmm. words. So mm-hmm. I notice a lot that they write, you know, like they just write mm-hmm. about what's happening to them and what they're mm-hmm. experiencing. Mm-hmm. So like that to me is very, very, very important. And so like I keep this journal that, I mean, I write in it like, pretty much every day at this point, you know, just even like small things, you know, it's like, okay, I experimented with this and this is what happened, or Mm -hmm. um, I'm experiencing this feeling and I don't understand why, you know, it's like, Mm -hmm. I feel like you can really start to gather and get a lot more understanding as to what's happening within the work. Um, Mm -hmm. You have um, ways to at least see what the right, what the artist is writing about. Yeah. And I mean, it's crazy. Like sometimes I'll read um things about from or think read things into Jack Witten's like notes from the woodshed and I'm just like kind of 
out by how close and how similar <laughs> certain thoughts are or I'll like mm-hmm. I'll read the same mm-hmm. thing in Louise Bourgeois diaries and I'm like how is it that this like you know this older French lady and like actually relates and totally <sighs> next to me in the same kinds of feelings across time yeah, you know? yeah. so it's yeah. it's really yeah I feel like that's like my motivation for writing um mm-hmm. it's just so that way I can almost keep track as to like what's happening to me especially within the studio you know mm-hmm. yeah I mean I totally see the connection with Louise Bourgeois because her work is all about the maternal um is all about feeling um all about feeling yeah yeah, 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 yeah. No, and it's I think all about the spiritual too yeah and the spiritual and like I think that's why I, I'm more tendent to artists like that. Like I, mm-hmm. I read that within Jack's work, like in, in this one particular quote, which I was gonna include in the text at the Simone show, but he said that art is all about being able to locate yourself in space. And he wrote it out in like all caps, which I thought mm-hmm. was like really intense. And also yeah. very, um, very much like ex- exactly how I feel. It's like, to me, art is one way that I can actually like know where I'm at and know what is happening to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this makes me think about Adrian Piper. Um, I mean, I also love artists who write as well too. Yeah. Um, I went to see her show, her record's big at, oh, big retrospective at MoMA like yeah I remember that 2019 and I I was super fascinated by that show and so I got her book out of out of sight out of out of sight out of mind Mm -hmm. and it's basically like her meditations um into philosophy uh into feminism like you also get a look into her childhood history and like her familial history as well too like the one powerful moment in the book is like when she talks about how her family basically split into two uh, because one family really wanted to revere um, their African heritage while the other Mm -hmm. one really wanted to embrace their whiteness and like them Mm -hmm. being um, part, you know, them being white. And like, Mm -hmm. they were also the rich family because they also owned Um, or like ran an airline or something like that Mm -hmm. and so like just from reading those writings too as a young artist uh, when I was reading that work it really helped me understand like what it means to make work and actually Mm -hmm. understanding your work through your writing and like how other artists also come to your aid uh, in helping in like really affirming um, your own experiences and like Mm -hmm. affirming certain ideas and like really pushing you to make more work and like be experimental as you want to um, given like now that we're reading these artists and like they're well revered you know they mm-hmm. are our icons in culture but mm-hmm. you know at some point like they're you know reading their work um jolts you it's like yeah these are also young artists and, like they <laughs> yeah, also they figured yeah, yeah like, they especially figured out throughout the way yeah I mean especially in the case of Louise you know it's mm-hmm. like that's like a whole whole long time before it, yeah know? much recognition and so it's like or at least there were still shows and things but it's like very different but yeah it's so yeah no reading their biographies or reading things that they just that they wrote themselves always Mm -hmm. gives me like like it's it just helps balance me out you know and I I mean I find it very beautiful in this way that it's it just it gives way to how much I know that time is an illusion just Mm -hmm. because all Mm -hmm. of the like may- very many of the things, especially like within Jack Whitten's like uh, writings, it's like almost one for one. You know, it's like the, mm. the exper- especially experiences as like a black um, abstractionist. Like I feel like I kind of am. It's like it's very yeah. I'm like wow, these are very much the same things that I'm going through, and very much the same yeah. thoughts, very yeah. much the same yeah. perceptions or whatever. And it's like oh okay. Yeah, I can keep doing this. <laughs> I can keep yeah, doing this. yeah, yeah. You know? It's very affirming. It's yeah, it's affirming, yeah. and that's the reason yeah. why I feel like I write just because I have to. Yeah, I feel like I have to affirm for myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just helps. What kind me. of feelings come up when you look at your old writing? Oof. I mean, usually like, okay, calm down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
like chill out it's gonna be fine like I think that that's what is wild to me is that I'll look at something that I wrote like you know four months ago and I'm like damn if you only knew like it's yeah like, oh, right you know, right okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, But in the Um, moment, it just, you got to divulge it out. (laughs) Yeah. 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 As someone who also writes as well in a very journalistic way, um, I also say the same, like whenever I read what I was feeling and like thinking in terms of like ideas and also things that are happening in my life, there's like that weird secondhand embarrassment being like, damn, like, where were you? What were you doing? But at the same time, it's like, I want to take, I take pride in that. Um, Cause it's a yeah. sense of growing. It's a way of really knowing yourself and like keeping a record of yourself is also very important. It's like, you yeah. see this exponential growth that you make over time. Like, right. you know, I'm not the same person that I'll be in like two weeks or like a month or so. Um, exactly. And it's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think that's, what I mean the work that I'm the most drawn to by other artists is like when I mm-hmm. see that that is aware you know what I'm saying mm-hmm, that, it, mm-hmm. that they are more interested in getting to know themselves through their work and I think that mm-hmm. when that happens and it's like it happens all the time it's like it does happen but it's like when you see Jack do it or like Louise do it or Ava do it it's just like whoa like uh, like you know it's like you're almost yeah. you can imagine how frightening it is to Mm -hmm. see what Mm -hmm. actually ends up coming out you know Mm -hmm. so and sometimes I think the things that I make I'm also at the same time like oh gosh like I hope I no one ever sees this just because it feels embarrassing you know what I mean it it feels like something that I would rather not share but um, at the same time I think that the the sharing is just what you it's the only way to let to actually release it you know what I mean Mm -hmm. it's the only Mm -hmm. real release otherwise I feel like you're just kind of filling yourself up with things that that you gotta let go of yeah and it becomes just an echo chamber um where it's just like your thoughts and your ideas and you're not able to externalize it with the world and you know that's something that's very important to artistic practices it's like the exchange that happens and all the empowerment that comes from that um yeah. like I think about you know me talking about this too like me showing you my work and like yeah, what I've been doing <laughs> which is really amazing work uh, <laughs> yeah like I like those are things that I want to foster in the long run um and like yeah um so this has been so lovely I want to keep some time to have questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question, you can just raise your hand or unmute yourself or throw a question in the chat. Hi, Denny. Hi, Cameron. Mm -hmm. I've been eyed. Hey, you guys, just wanted to say hello. what a great conversation. And um, just quickly about your writing, which is interesting. Uh, I had not thought about that or, or th- thought about it in relationship to your work, I, or, which I guess is my question. So, cause I think Denny was great to ask you about your writing is, I'm just thinking about text in your work and I'm remembering one piece in the show at Simone's that has text in it. Mm-hmm. Um, and forgive me for not knowing exactly what it is off the top of my head, but because I remember asking her about it and I said, oh, this is interesting. I haven't seen a lot of text in the sculptures or the drawings. Yeah. So maybe if you just had a few words or thoughts on that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, it's a very recent development. I was actually in the studio today and like adding or writing on some of my drawings. Yeah, it's the piece I think you're talking about is the one that has like these post-it notes that are actually encased inside like blue vinyl. And those post-it notes are things that I keep in the studio just because I'm constantly thinking about stuff even as I'm making things. And then um, either like something will catch it and then I'll be like, oh, okay, hold on. I have to like write that down in order to, you know, keep it together, <laughs> keep myself together. Um, and so yeah those post-it notes are like really personal to me but like that's what I think I like about it the most is that they remain on this very mundane like you know something that's like almost like total office-y but like you Mm. know what with now the significance of it being 
you know, made into an artwork, it's like, oh no, this is actual like meaningful things. And then I kind of showed it alongside um, these orange peels that I've been keeping also and collecting within the studio. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, text showing up in the work is a very new thing, but I feel like it's something that I want to give way more towards, especially like if I'm reading, uh, I remember reading Louise Bourgeois like drawings, like some of her drawings also have text on them or she'll like mm -hmm. write like a little bit to the drawing itself. And I've always just like appreciated like how almost like how cutting it is, you know? It's like, it just gets right to the point. It almost like drives in the screw of mm. whatever could be going on within the work and what's ever going on within the drawing. And I've like always appreciated that. So it's like, it's, yeah, it's like something that I feel like I can, I get better at the more that I draw, which is weird. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's like the more that I draw, I can actually like start to understand what it is I'm trying to, you know, language, like actually use language to say anything. Yeah. yeah, it sounds very similar to how captions work for a photograph. Exactly. Um, you know, like when it's a, just a photograph, it just exists as a photograph, but the captioning adds and contextualizes the photograph um, in another way, uh, in another, in a whole other different way. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Cameron. And thank you both again for sharing uh your time with us tonight cameron for sharing your insight uh for cameron for sharing your work and denny for sharing as always your insights of course of course thank you thanks for being here bernard it's nice to see you uh, i have a question for you cameron when you are exploring materials or new materials does it kind of organically shape itself in the process of making or do you go in with an intention i know you said you use drawing to kind of plan out so mm -hmm. is it very precise like you have it all drawn out exactly as you want it to be um or does it kind of organically take that shape and take that kind of meaning for you as you're working with the material i mean it just kind of happens yeah because there's no i don't the way that i draw i don't draw like sketches of pieces and if it is it's still very much like a drawing you know it's like it is what it is um but yeah no every time i start working with another material i mean it's just then it's just about effort <laughs> then it's mm -hmm. just about like literal just constant working and working and working and doing and doing and failing and failing you know because like even like those final pieces that were in double dutch there was like a ton of things that had to be made in order to like even be able to understand how to make that material work for itself um mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think that's one thing that i love about working in this way is that i don't have an end goal which only then leads to more things that can happen it just like it feels more not like a shut in case as in that way, you know, mm -hmm. it'd be a different thing if I like only worked with bronze and then I went into the intricacies and like loving of that, which I do. And I'm that kind of person, but then at the same time, I need to be able to like literally throw on the gloves and just throw things around and squish it and quench it and fold it and wrinkle it and, you know, pull it back apart in order to like really get it to be um, something that isn't, I feel like is being made outside of me, if that makes any sense. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's like I almost want to use the materials as as if it was like an improvisational script. So that way I'm not like whatever comes out just comes out and it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a way to distill things again, you know. I love that metaphor. <laughs> um. <laughs> and I love the quote that you said from Jack Witten that art is all about being able to locate yourself in space. I think that is really wonderful and a great to, a great quote to teach with as well about artists. Yeah. Yeah, it just feels it just that's I think it's like exactly how I think about art and how I feel about it. Yeah, because I mean, every time I make a drawing, it's it's just comforting, you know, Cause like, I mean, you know how like physics, like I'm kind of, I'm really nerdy. <laughs> like, Cause you know how like in physics, they talk about things being made in a vacuum and you need a vacuum in order to like see how things work. 
that's you know and I feel like drawing is in the same vein where it's it's like that paper is so stark you know it's so scary you know like you look at it and it's so scary because it's just so empty and you don't know what to to do with it and then as soon as you start engaging and stop trying to do anything then you can actually like formulate something in there you know and so that's how I think about it it's like that nowhere space exists on that page like like paper is nowhere space for me you know and it's like I can locate myself through drawing you know it's like I'm like oh yeah I'm that and I'm like that weird little weird shape and I'm also like these weird rays and you know like I can actually start to form uh what it is that I already knew <laughs> you know like externalize what it is I already knew Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So what's next for you, Cameron? Or do you have um some new exciting materials that you're exploring in your studio that are coming up in the future that you may, uh, you know, introduce to the world. Yeah, I mean, the next thing will be hamburger, which happens in the fall. So like, I'm gonna kind of, I'm, I was already back in the studio and just working very slowly. <laughs> mm. But like without, you know, it feels very, it feels very nice in there right now. Um, I would say probably be a lot of text. There will be perhaps some satin. And yeah, I think I won't go any further than that. <laughs> Ooh, I love this. I, I love won't say this. anything more than that. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. No, I'm excited to see what ends up coming out. I, yeah, it's going to be fun. Awesome. Awesome. Um, perhaps we'll end here. Um, it was really lovely talking to you, Cameron, um, and getting to know about your practice. Um, and thank you, Stacy, for hosting us. And thank you, Bernard, as well, too, and everyone who also came to our talk. Um, I appreciate it a lot. I'm also thank seeing you. your show on uh, Saturday, and I'm very excited for that, too. I'll, I'll let through. you know. Yeah, yeah, everyone yeah, yeah. should should go see Cameron's show and visit Cameron's uh, wonderful website where you have tons of great writing on there. So it's a lot of a lot to explore and to learn more about you. Thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Uh, the both of you were really grateful. And Bernard, thank you for the introduction to Cameron. Um, we have lots of great programs coming up and just pull up my slide real quickly. But um, this coming weekend, we have a family workshop. Uh, inspired by Kara Walker. We have a taste of art which pairs recipes, a Dominican pan de batata recipe from Made by Lino um, with works from the Luag collection. And then we have a diversity peer educators program uh, by Lehigh University students in the Young, Gifted and Black exhibition, exploring the work of Sadie Barnett. So we hope you will all join us for these. Uh, this video recording will be available on our website as well as lots of really great resources um, from the Young, Gifted and Black exhibition. We hope that you'll explore that. Um, and just so grateful to Danny and Cameron uh, for the wonderful discussion this evening. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the future. So thank you so much everyone for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Awesome. Bye everyone, have a good night. Bye.